I'm in Amish country, everyone. I'm here in a small village called Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, and I'm checking out, I think, one of the most infamous murders that have come out of the Amish country here. You guys have probably heard of this case, most likely, but this is all about the infamous Amish schoolhouse murders. So I'm actually here in town, I'm gonna walk up the road show you guys where the schoolhouse was and i'm going to show you guys hopefully some of the the victims graves but of course we're going to talk about the story along the way and you'll probably see some some amish people i've already seen about 30 of them in their little carriages or buggies it's very cool so let's get into it so the schoolhouse murders happened on october 2nd 2006 the perpetrator, his name was Charles Roberts IV. Now Charles was 32. He was married and had several kids of his own, but he went to the small schoolhouse here, again in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. And what he did inside that schoolhouse will live with everyone in this community for the rest of their lives. It was absolute horror. Now, it was around 10.25 or so in the morning. Charles had brought with him many different weapons, including a Springfield 9mm handgun, a Browning 12-gauge shotgun, as well as a Ruger 30-06 rifle. Um, he also brought many other tools and things. As his goal was to essentially keep everyone hostage, board up the doors, and then kill everyone inside. Charles backed up his pickup truck to the front of the Amish schoolhouse. He asked a teacher named Emma Zook and several students if they had seen a missing clevis pin on the road. Again, I don't even know what that is, but I guess he just asked them you know, just, just some random question, like, did you see this missing pin outside? I guess just as a ruse to get them comfortable with him. After the teacher and several students said they had not seen this random pin, he went back out to his truck and re-entered the school holding his Springfield 9mm handgun. Now, at this point, he ordered all the boys in the schoolhouse to come outside and help him carry in all the different tools and weapons that he had. Now, at this point, the teacher, Emma, and her mother, who was visiting, took that chance to escape. And so they actually bolted out of there, leaving, I guess, most of the kids or all the kids. But of course, at that point, Emma was able to reach one of the farmhouses nearby and asked them to call 911. Meanwhile, Charles and the boys were loading in different things to the schoolhouse. Um, he had the boys carry in lumber, a shotgun, a stun gun, wires, chains, nails, and other tools. Now at this point, after he got all the tools inside, he allowed a pregnant woman, three parents with infants, and all the remaining boys to exit the schoolhouse. But he kept all the girls, for the most part, inside as hostages. The first trooper arrived at approximately 10.42 in the morning about six or seven minutes after the 911 call. The police, of course, attempted to communicate with Charles via their PA system on their patrol car. They asked him to throw out the weapons and exit the schoolhouse. However, he refused. By this point, though, it was around 11 a.m., a large crowd of police officers, neighbors, just other random people showed up. Um, they even established contact via telephone to Charles, as he, I guess he had his cell phone with him. 
but uh, he continued to threaten violence against all the school kids. Now guys, what you're seeing in front of you, this is where the former schoolhouse once stood. I'll try to insert some pictures so you can see, kind of try to compare. Um, but in the background you can see, obviously like a, a white barn. And I don't know if you can see it behind it, it's like a tall silo. And uh, I had to do a lot of research, but I matched up these trees and that white barn and I was able to match up the crime scene photos. So the schoolhouse would have been kind of in the middle of the screen here. All the young girls kind of had a bad feeling. They knew that this wasn't gonna end well as Charles was not backing down. Shortly before Charles started shooting though, two sisters named Marianne and Barbara Fisher, who were 13 and 11 years old, requested that they be shot first so that others might be spared. Barbara was wounded and Marianne was killed. Charles opened fire, shooting at least 10 of the young girls, ended up killing five of them. He had shot at least 13 rounds from his pistol. Charles then ended up taking his own life there inside the schoolhouse. So Charles, he was a milk tank driver who served several of the Amish farms in this nickel mines area including some of the victims families some of the young girls that he killed their families he served milk to now on the day of the shooting charles last saw his wife around 8 45 in the morning he had walked his own three children to the bus stop and when his wife returned home around 11 a.m. She discovered four different suicide notes, one addressed to herself and one to each of his three children. Uh, Charles even called his wife from the schoolhouse and told her a very interesting story. Charles claimed that when he was younger, he had molested two of his own female relatives between the ages of three and five. He said that he was around 12 years old when that happened. And he said that he had been daydreaming about molesting again. Now, what makes this even more interesting and bizarre is the fact that those two young relatives came forward after the shooting happened and they disclosed that Charles never once molested them when they were younger. They claimed that that was not true whatsoever. So it begs the question, why did Charles make up this random story about molesting these two young relatives? Was it some sort of justification in his own mind? That way he could go ahead with committing these murders. I am not sure to be honest, but from what I've been reading, it sounds like Charles didn't actually molest or sexually assault any of the girls that he killed. 